on Prime Crime. Charles Sam 7 Young 882. Hey, stop that car! A night of partying ends in tragedy. You go straight to the active shooter and try to neutralize the threat. And an officer's actions in the spotlight. Were you trying to seriously injure or kill the driver of that car? I was trying to stop the threat inside the vehicle, correct. Hey there, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Crime. This is where we do a deeper dive into the most high profile and memorable true crime cases. What starts as a routine police encounter ends up becoming a major legal and national story. Hey, uh, Hamburglar, come here. Have a seat. It's April 29th, 2017, and police officers Tyler Gross and Roy Oliver are responding to a house party in Balch Springs, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. I stood there, man, go right into it just for a few months, just to have some fun. All these millennials like, it's money! Uh-huh. Make it hurt you. This is a common call, actually. I've been on a bunch of these. You roll up with your partner back up, and you start putting the siren on that is common to let everyone know, hey, we're here, we're coming here, obviously we were called here, you guys need to break it up and get gone. Where are you at school? West All these West Mesquite kids? Listen, don't do this again. Yeah, this is a one time thing, sir. One of the things you wanna do is you wanna to talk to people at the same level that that person is. If you're talking to teenagers, you wanna to try to relate to them on their level. I thought they did a good job doing that. I didn't think these officers were hostile or overly aggressive. While teenage house parties are broken up constantly across the country, as you're about to see, this one doesn't end like the rest. Mr. Rhodes, I'm Officer Gross, okay? Officer Gross. I don't, I don't want to see this again. Yeah, I don't want to see this again. I ain't expected to get this I don't. Tight. Gunshots ring out, and officers Gross and Oliver run to the street. At that point, you have to be thinking in today's society that we have an active shooter. You at least have to rule that out. The current school of thought now is that you go straight to the active shooter and try to neutralize the threat, try to stop the threat. Hey, stop that car! Stop right there! Stop! At the point that Officer Gross is trying to stop these cars, he's probably trying to do a couple of things. Number one is he's trying to identify whether or not any of these people was involved in the shooting. Number two, and a lot of people don't think about this, you wanna make sure that somebody's not transporting a victim away. Sometimes teenagers may panic, load a gunshot victim in the car and try to get them to the doctor themselves. Yet the driver of one car doesn't follow Officer Gross's demands. At the same time, Officer Oliver retrieves his semi-automatic rifle from the squad car. When you carry your rifle in the back of your vehicle, we're trained to carry it and it's called cruiser ready. And what that means is you have your safety on and you don't have any rounds chambered. And you do that so that there are no accidental discharges. What he did is he took the safety off and he chambered around in case he needed to actually use that weapon. Copy 28, Charles Sam 7 Young 882. Charles Sam 7 Young 882. Hey, stop that car. Stop that car right now. Those kids could be scared. Those kids would be not involved at all in the shooting, you just have alcohol in a car and trying to get away. But you know, you have to assume the worst that there is potentially a shooter in this vehicle. And so they're trying to get this vehicle stopped and then you, you see the vehicle not comply and things really kind of go downhill from there. Officer Oliver opens fire on the moving car, ultimately killing one of the passengers. 15-year-old Jordan Edwards. In the end, the investigation would show the original gunshots came from nearby gang members firing in the air and that neither Edwards nor anyone in that car were armed. Whenever an officer uses a firearm, at that moment when they pull the trigger, you have to ask what is in the mind of that officer at that moment. 
were the actions of Mr. Oliver reasonable at that moment? So what was Oliver thinking? You all right? You got fine? Uh, you're trying to hit you. Is that possible? That's absolutely what went through his mind. I, I, I do think that that's possible. Do I also think it's possible that Officer Oliver had a moment of, I just fired five rifle rounds into a vehicle that was fleeing away and, you know, something needs to be said. After a formal review, Roy Oliver would be fired and later charged with aggravated assault and murder. The question was, was this a crime or justifiable use of force? When you shoot into a moving car or attempt to shoot into a moving car, run a very high risk of killing an innocent bystander. That is a risk. When we return, Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Stop that car! Stop that car right now! Stop that car! In April 2017, down in Balch Springs, Texas, police attempt to break up a house party filled with teenagers. Listen, don't do this again. Yeah, this is a one time thing, sir. Yet when gunshots ring out, I expected to get this I don't. tight. Law enforcement desperately try to stop any potential suspects from fleeing the scene, but when a car filled with several people doesn't halt to Officer Tyler Gross's demands, that's when his partner, 37-year-old Officer Roy Oliver, opens fire on the car, striking and killing a passenger, 15-year-old Jordan Edwards. Not only was neither Edwards nor anyone in that car the active shooter that night, but none of those occupants were armed. So why did Oliver feel it necessary to shoot? You all right? You got fine? Uh, you're trying to hit you. Roy Oliver was charged with murder and aggravated assault for the death of Edwards. However, securing a conviction against the former officer and ex-Marine would be anything but simple for prosecutors. It is rare for an officer to be found guilty of an on-duty shooting. And it was more rare back then especially in Texas, which is a very pro-law enforcement state, they're going to cut that officer a break. With a nation watching, this critical trial began in August 2018. All five of these shots, all of them, including the first one, were fired after the Chevrolet and Pilot had already cleared past Tyler Gross. No danger whatsoever, none. That fast. That young man right there had to make that decision. Does it have to be a perfect decision? No. Does he have to be absolutely right? No, it has to be reasonable. In this trial, there wasn't a police interrogation of the defendant for the jury to watch. Instead, they had the opportunity to hear from Roy Oliver in real time when he decided to testify. He had to take the stand. You have to put that officer on the stand to put forward the theory and the defense that I didn't have time to do slow motion and look at it in slices of one one hundredth of a second. It was a spur of a moment, but what was before me, what I knew before and during this event was reasonable. Just from the dispatch, it made it sound like there's some juveniles stumbling around on the sidewalks drunk. He testified very professionally. He was very knowledgeable and he's very aware of police policy, procedures, tactics. So he did very well with that. Then we heard gunshots. It sounded like a semi-automatic or maybe multiple semi-automatics going off in a very close proximity to where we were at. Oliver explains how the shooting played out. Then I was hearing, stop the car, stop the car, stop the effing car. I thought he had 
located the shooter or shooters. In that nine seconds, I've gone from a retrieve the rifle, made sure it was in proper working order, went from a walk to a run. I'm focused on Gross, his mannerisms, his actions, his voice. The only reason I'm thinking he's going after is active shooters. He's got them located. We've got to stop the vehicle. It does happen fast. I have been involved in, in, in situations where things happen very rapidly. And I think the courts give a lot of deference to the officers for that reason. They realize that this is a tough job, that things do happen quickly. The vehicle came to a stop for a slight moment and then accelerated. It came forward towards my partner. Car, a deadly weapon? Car is a deadly weapon. Use of force basically says, unless the vehicle is coming directly at you and you have no way to get out of the way and you're about to be ran over, then you are able to use deadly force to stop the threat. When do you think you made the decision to fire that weapon? When the vehicle was moving towards my partner. I almost watched my partner get hit by a car. I was trying to stop threats. Is Oliver correct? Was the car moving towards his partner, Officer Gross? Hey, stop that car! Stop that car right now! Stop the car! The body cam footage was not the best. From what I saw, the car was not a threat. What I saw was someone inside of a vehicle trying to get away. It appeared to me that they were not trying to aim specifically at him. And of course, you never know what's in the mind of the driver or the, anyone in the vehicle. Perceived as an aggressive threat is a tricky question. And the reason why is because it's based on the officer who is there at the time, at the scene, in the situation, and what kind of fear they're in or how much fear that they're in. Up next, the jury hears some surprising testimony from Oliver's former partner. I felt that I needed representation because I was being pushed to be uh, testify in one way. As it was gaining ground towards him, I had to make a decision. This car is about to hit my partner. There are threats inside the car. And when lethal force is being presented towards us, I had no other option but to use lethal force. In 2018, former officer Roy Oliver is on trial for murder and aggravated assault in connection with the shooting of 15-year-old Jordan Edwards outside of a house party. Oliver took the stand, and he testified that after gunfire erupted in the neighborhood, he and his partner, Officer Tyler Gross, encountered a car that refused to stop. Oliver believed that the car was about to run over Gross. That's when he says he had no choice but to open fire on the vehicle ultimately killing Edwards, who was a passenger. The prosecution, though, had some more questions for Oliver. Do you know all of the uh, problems, reasons why you don't shoot moving cars? All of them? I don't think there's a way to know all of them. What I observed was when he was cross-examined, there are just little moments where you can tell he does not like being challenged at all. You killed an innocent bystander, and your zeal to kill a driver? I'm not ex understanding the zeal. Okay, and your decision to kill the driver? Decision to stop the threat of dr the driver is one of them, correct. Do you admit that you killed an innocent <coughs> bystander? He was a perceived threat at that time. Perceived threat as a passenger in the car? We're responding to gunshots to an active shooter. The car is being told to stop, be detained. The passenger was moving, making avertive movements. Do not know what that, what that passenger was trying to do or get. Roy Oliver's claim that he was justified using deadly force to protect his partner got a bit complicated when this partner took the stand. Did you ever fear, feel in fear of your life? No. Did you ever shoot that car? No. Did you ever feel the need to shoot that car? No. I didn't feel like the vehicle was trying to hit me. Officer Gross was the one that was closest to the vehicle. And if he's not feeling his life was in danger, I'm not sure why Officer Oliver feels that it was. I think it's a factor. Is it a uh, dispositive factor? No. It is possible for one officer to reasonably perceive another officer in danger, especially if they see something from a different angle 
and actually be justified in firing and another officer from a different angle or different perspective not be aware that they're in danger. It doesn't have to be a unanimous decision to fire. The prosecution, though, wasn't finished. They also presented evidence that two weeks prior to the shooting of Edwards, Oliver got into a volatile road rage incident. He uh, walked up to the car and he just asked for, um, he already had his gun out. He was already pointing at me. And when he got right here, um, next, when I turned to the side, all I could see is the end of the gun in my face. The gun was in your face? Yeah. Are you sure about that? I'm positive. I can't forget a gun in my face. He was off duty. He was not in his uniform. He was with his family. And he ended up pulling his weapon out and going into police mode while being rear-ended by a woman and two juveniles in their vehicle. And again, that's another example for me personally of going, this guy escalates everything. I've been a police officer involved in car accidents before. I don't go into police mode. I don't know that that was relevant at all. Does it make it more or less likely that this officer acted as a reasonable objective officer in this case? I don't think for two seconds that Roy Oliver woke up that morning with the intention of killing someone at work. I don't think he woke up that morning bloodthirsty, want to go shoot someone. I think that that is his worst nightmare and every other officer's worst nightmare. That, that's not what you want to get involved in. Coming up, the jury makes their decision. State of Texas versus Roy Oliver. The verdict form reads as follows. We, the jury, unanimously... Think all court shows are the same? We're talking about your father. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Think again. Judge Caprio rules with common sense. I was having contractions. I was rushing to the hospital. Inspector Quinn, what does justice demand? Jail? <laughs> and compassion. I'm going to take the circumstances into consideration. The best court experience I've had. Clearly, Judge, he's been in a court before. Get caught in Providence. Hi, I'm Dan Abrams. In the exploding legal and true crime genre, Law & Crime is the only network that has it all. Good evening and welcome. This is a complicated case. There's Don't really jump to conclusions. Welcome to Prime Crime Tonight, another day of drama between both sides. From multiple live trials daily to original and compelling programming, the Law & Crime Network is everywhere, and we invite you inside the jury box. This is Law & Crime. Stop that car right now! Roy Oliver, a former Balch Springs, Texas police officer, is on trial for the killing of 15-year-old Jordan Edwards, a teenager he gunned down outside of a house party. The prosecution argued this was murder. The defense claimed that Oliver exercised justifiable use of deadly force because Oliver believed that the car containing Edwards was about to hit his partner, Officer Tyler Gross. After more than 13 hours of deliberations, the jury returned their verdict. Please rise for the reading of the verdict. We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. The jury convicted Roy Oliver of murder, but acquitted him of two counts of aggravated assault. The verdict was just, you're saying a police officer committed murder. That is a huge deal. No video, no justice. That's the theme of this case. If we didn't have videos, Officer Oliver would have been found not guilty or uh, there would have been a hung jury. For Officer Oliver to react in the manner that he did, it just was not appropriate. It's not legal. It wasn't within department standards, practices, policies. It wasn't within the use of force policy that is pretty much standardized across the nation. Officers like him make it harder for all the other officers that are out there doing it right. Now it became a question of Roy Oliver's sentence, a decision once again in the hands of the jury. Before deliberating, they heard testimony from members of both sides of this case. Did you have real high hopes for Jordan, did you, sir? Yes, I did. He, he, he was a great kid. You know, like again, everybody always told me 
you got, all your kids is good in sports, but that's the one. That's the one. I heard that a lot. Are you asking the jury to consider all of Roy's good qualities? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and my son is always asking for it, Dad. <laughs> We, the jury, having found the defendant, Roy Oliver, guilty of murder and having made a negative finding on the special issue of sudden passion, assess the defendant's punishment at imprisonment in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 15 years. I thought the sentence of 15 years was appropriate. I know the family of the victim wanted more. However, uh, I thought that the 15 years uh, is a significant sentence. That is a lot for an officer, but it also shows that officers, even when they are convicted, uh, they do get less time than an average citizen who may have committed a similar crime. While Roy Oliver is eligible for parole in 2026, he may get a different second chance. At the time of this taping, Texas's highest criminal court has agreed to hear his case. The Court of Criminal Appeals in Texas is reviewing whether Officer Oliver's statements to internal affairs were put aside. You cannot use statements given by a police officer in a, an internal affairs investigation. The Court of Criminal Appeals is looking into whether somehow those statements were used directly or indirectly in that criminal investigation. If that happens, you're gonna have a new trial. I think that this case highlights a couple of things. I think it highlights that we are moving in the right direction as a country and holding officers accountable as they should be. I think it highlights the need for departments to go back and take a long look at their training. How do we prevent this from happening in the future? This officer made a bad decision and he did get trigger happy. A kid lost his life. A family lost seeing this kid grow up, get married, have kids, graduate school, go through life, experience those years with him. That's a big deal. This officer was doing what he thought was right, but he was wrong and it had a bad consequence. Whatever ends up happening in the legal case of Roy Oliver, that in no way changes the fact that Jordan Edwards should be alive today. If this story can serve as a cautionary tale for even just one police officer in the future, then not only will Edwards not have died in vain, but another teenager's life may be saved. That's all we have for you here on Prime Crime. Leave us your comments on Instagram and Twitter with the hashtag Prime Crime. As always, thank you for joining us, and until next time, be safe.